Hi everyone, welcome to the Boys Club. I'm Clark Wolf. I'm Holly Payne. And this is our True Detective Perspective. So before we start, uh, this is what happens when I don't wear my glasses, apparently, <laughs> because we had a couple of problems last week. Just a few minor Just a ones. few little problems. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if you watched last week's episode, our we had no video, um, because there was a little glitch, which Holly noticed, and I was like, oh, it's fine. And um, <laughs> it was not fine. It totally messed up our audio. It totally messed up everything, which is why you were treated to a lovely still of myself and Holly. Um, and <laughs> you MacGyvered it though. Yeah, so, we, you know. we salvaged a little. And then um, in regards to Mr. Kerry Fukunaga, yes, um, he who has is, been directing all of the episodes. And to be fair, just so you guys know, not that we're making excuses, we excuses, but um, we looked it up on a mobile device on the IMDb app, and, and we could not get any further back than the last four episodes. Yeah, and so we were like, oh, it must have been just these four episodes. Right. So we, we read. Thank you for correcting Thank us. Thank you very much. We appreciate, we appreciate it. it. We um and we read so we we read our we read our phones wrong and we apologize. <laughs> um and, and keep in mind too, we are just again, we're just watching this the same way you are. We're watching it yes. episode by episode. Um I've gotten a little more in depth in the internet research this week because I can't not be. I can't help myself at this point. But um but up until that point we're just kinda of excited that we've this this most exciting like directorial flourish oh my gosh. from Fukunaga was kind of what, what put him on the map. Yeah, know? because I mean, let's, that's actually, it may, might be a good place to just start real fast. Uh, before that crazy shot yeah. in, in episode four. The one everyone was talking yeah, about. Yeah, the six yeah. minute take. I mean, the visual style we had commented on a little bit, um, uh, but this was definitely last week was the most um, cinematic. Yeah. And I would argue that was the thing. You mean thing. episode four? Yes, I yeah. mean episode four. Uh, and I would argue that that is the thing that kind of made me go, who's directing this? Absolutely. I don't think I was really paying that. I was paying much more attention to uh, to the dialogue right. than I was the direction at that point, which actually is, that's that kind of exemplifies why he's such a good director also because yes. he was not overshadowing overshadowing excuse me the overshadowing the dialogue that we were or enjoying the acting, or, or the, the acting or the or the locations or all of the exactly. above exactly yeah. so um so that 6 minute scene was like here i am you know and that's why that's when we were all on our phones like who is this exactly. guy exactly exactly um, so so let's get into the last night's episode yes and why don't you start since you've got a lot well, okay, um, I'm actually going to go back a little bit because I started rewatching, going back to episode three, um, The Locked Room, to start to see if I could piece together this jigsaw that we're all trying to figure out. And, um, and especially since everyone's been talking about Robert W. Chambers. The Yellow King. Yeah, The King in Yellow. That's well, right. The Yellow King is the name of the compilation of short stories. Okay, The Yellow King is the compilation, and The King in Yellow is the play. The correct? play that exists inside the anthology of right. stories, which we never actually read. Yeah. We never get to see the the king in yellow you are only treated to little snippets and little paragraphs as the characters in this anthology of short stories okay. read this as well but okay. the co the anthology itself is called the yellow king okay yes. now see this is important too because much like many of you i have not read it clark read it um there are a lot of us who haven't read it so we're just kind of going along with um what we've heard about mm -hmm. the mythos of all of this but there are certain things that are just really obvious that are being wedged in, not wedged in there, very delicately placed in there, um, that completely parallel directly to um, The King in Yellow, mm -hmm. the, the play. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I noticed was the preacher in episode three, the opening, one of the opening scenes, uh, I think his name is Therio or mm -hmm. Theriot, um, he, he actually says, and this is not directly lifted from the play, but he says, as he's preaching, he says, he saw you in those dark corners. He, th he heard those thoughts. You are a stranger to yourself, yet he knows you. This world is a veil and the face you wear is not your own. And that is a direct link. It's a direct parallel to a reference in the King in Yellow Act 1, Scene 2, where they're talking about masks and uh, and you not being, like, a, one character, the stranger, or Camilla, I think her name is, anyway, mm. um, wearing a mask, or everyone in the room is wearing a mask, and she's not, and they say, take your mask off, and she says, but I'm not wearing one, um, 
anyway, that, that's just one reference. But they're all, they're obviously, they're, they're littered throughout the entire series. And you can go on and make yourself crazy. <laughs> which I think this show is trying to do. Can I, can I interject real fast? Yeah, absolutely. The idea to me that is really important here, um, which is, it's so cool that um, we are noticing this world within a world. We are noticing this, this ref these references inside of the show. And But I think that with each episode, and we've talked about this on this show before, mm -hmm. with each episode we are realizing more and more that both uh, Rust um, and, and um, Co not, Rape. Marty. Hart. Sorry. I get their names yeah. all, you know. But um, both Rust and Marty are uh, are wearing masks themselves. Absolutely. They are all portraying who they are, you know, th this thing to the outside. And we saw that in this episode more than any other. I mean, with the lies that they told and told beautifully. I loved that. Oh, my gosh. Can we talk about yeah. that? More specifically. How from... believable and how, I mean, how many years had they been telling that, that lie? That was unbelievable. They gave me chills. I was Just like... so perfectly executed. And what we're referencing, of course, is uh, talking about the incident. I guess, is that the incident in the woods that they yeah. were referencing from episodes prior? I think so. I think okay. So. so basically, uh, they go to Ledoux. Mm -hmm. They find Ledoux and they basically go in and all hell breaks loose, right. but not necessarily in the way that they have told their superiors no. or gone on record. The As they recount the story that happens in the woods it is completely fabricated. Yeah. It is not even close to how it happened, um, and we see that, but what was brilliant and fantastic was the juxtaposition between both Marty Hart and Rust Cole telling the story separately mm -hmm. at different time periods. Yeah. That's what I loved. My favorite part, aside from how cool it was, it was yeah. this beautiful reveal, my favorite part was watching... Uh, watching Cole tell the story 17 years down the line or however, you know, in present, in present day, day. And versus... then cutting back to both both of them telling the story in as it exactly right, as, it, yeah. as it happened, as it took place. Mm -hmm. That was just, I mean, just absolutely. And they still stuck to the story. And in fact, I mean, Marty even says the, the story isn't any different than... 17, seven, how many years he's been telling it? Because yeah. it only happened one way. Yep. And, uh, and it's funny because you can kind of, it's, Rust actually gives some tells when he's, when he's going on about his, you know, memory of how it happened. He kind of, his eyes go up and to the side every time he tells a lie. I've noticed like there's, hmm. there, well, every time he's, we know he's telling a lie. Hmm. There's this kind of like, let's see what you'll buy. Cause he's playing with those investigators. Yep. So he, and like, also what we heard was that, uh, was when Marty said, was he reading you or were you, you know, were you, was he reading you or were you reading, right. you know, the right. other way around? Yep. And clearly I think what, what Rust was trying to do is to glean as much information oh, as absolutely. he could get from the investigators to find out what they knew. Because and that's why he's like, why are you being so, why are you so not hot to give me the file? Mm -hmm. Um, clearly they think that, that Rust is the suspect. Right. Um, I don't believe that to be the case at all, no. uh, nor do I believe that it's Marty. Um, and obviously it's not Reggie Ledoux. One of the things that I noticed while rewatching episode three mm -hmm. was when, uh, when Marty is talking to the two young girls that are at the, um, at the revival, mm -hmm. um, and he's asking them questions and they start talking to him about a tall man. Mm -hmm. Now we haven't heard much mention again of this tall man, but they just they give a pretty good description of him. They said that he has a strange face and, you know, a shiny neck and mm -hmm. possibly scarred. Um, but we haven't heard mention of that again since then. Um, so that's another seed that was planted that we haven't actually that hasn't been reincorporated for the last couple mm -hmm. of episodes, but it's still out there in the ether. So, um, that's another thing that we have to find out, we have to address again. One of the other things, obviously, is the fact that Cole is lurking around the the most recent. Right, he's he's on this. He's on the scene. Yeah. He disappeared for years prior, just yeah. off the grid. And we don't know where he went. But you know, here's the here's the thing, and here's why I call shenanigans on the idea of him doing it. I mean, or or Cole being being a legitimate suspect. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand why why the how the detectives are going to sit there and say, yeah, he he disappeared for a couple of years. Now he's back. He re-registered his driver's license. That kind of stood out to me as okay. 
okay, so he's not hiding. No, he's not like, at all. Like, that, that was the thing. It's just like, I don't understand. I mean, I guess maybe the other side of that is they're, they're, um, they're, they're hinting at the idea that Cole is is so bravose that he just comes right back on the scene. But, I mean, what it's more overconfidence. on? Overconfidence? Yeah, maybe, but I, I well, don't know. Well, he's shown just, a lot of overconfidence at this point already. Yeah, I just, but... I don't buy the whole idea. I mean, obviously, you guys know my theory. Oh, and here's, okay, so something else I want to interject. Sure. Um, is when, I think that Marty told a lot on his face mm-hmm. towards the end. Um because when he said, you know, why are you guys here? Why are you guys talking to me about this? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and he says some, and they, they, you know, the detectives start kind of throwing ideas at Marty, like, about why it could be cold. Like, but they've been leading him forever, Well, though. okay, so here's what I was going to say, is the kind of look on Marty's face was kind of like, yeah, I don't buy it, yeah, I don't buy it. But it reminded me a bit of kind of, or it made me think of earlier in the episode when they're both telling the same lie. And, and it kind of made me go, I think that they have each other's back on this. I totally think so, too. I, I don't think that, I think that they both know whatever they know, mm-hmm. whether it's one of them is involved, mm-hmm. whether it's they know who's invo- involved but can't say for some reason, or, or some other thing that I haven't thought of or nobody else has thought of yet. Right. I, I think they both know, and I think they are both... You think they both know what, though? I think they both know some secret about the other that would be incriminating in th- pertaining to this case. Right. And they have each other's back. Well, we know one of those things already. One of them, they already told us in the uh, in the episode, which is obviously the, the incident in the wood, woods when they were, right. you know, the shootout, which is kind of a giant lie, especially if you're, if you're an investigator, mm-hmm. if you're a detective. So they have that big lie, but there's, I think there's something personal. Right. We haven't even seen yet. Um, because we know they had a falling out. Yeah. And we haven't we seen what that is We still don't know yet. what it is. Right. We I think it's marital. I think it's something to do with, I still think it's something maybe to do with uh, Marty's wife, mm-hmm. potentially. Um, but at the same time, um, we also hear, going back to the episode, we also hear about Rust having this this phase where he actually has a girlfriend yeah. for a while. Yep. Um, and that dissolves. And when does that dissolve? Right. Do you remember when that dissolves? Like when that, what happens is that he, from what Marty's um, recollection of the of the whole incident is he says that that rust has had this girlfriend he finally finds somebody obviously that he sure that tolerates him and then um and then we go to the interrogation room Mm -hmm. where rust is interrogating the guy who has information about him him, about the murders right um we don't know that it's but he doesn't he say i know about you he says i know about you he says that he also says, I mean, yes, absolutely, he does have, he, he implies that he has information about Rust. But he also says something which, um, if you watch, there's a blurb, there's a, um, a clip that um, the director and creator of the show mentions. He says, um, he says that in police work, when uh, a suspect says something that is called a key uh, to an investigator, it's, it's evidence or it's something that has, that, that only that suspect knows that's pertaining to the case that no one else would know. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, after we already found out that the two guys have already, they've, you know, supposedly solved the case, it's been in all the papers, it's been publicized, there's information this guy could know, then there's information that this guy could not know. The information he couldn't know at all is, A, that, yes, Rust, he knows Rust from somewhere, Mm -hmm. but also he mentions the Yellow King. Right. Um, And that triggers Rust in a pretty intense way. Because now Rust's, you know, his, it seems like something's been unlocked with him. So, let's just go l- touch on that. Sorry, ref- I went on. No, no, on. that's good, because I want to touch on that quick reference to the Yellow King, because I think that's the most obvious. And Holly and I talked before we started recording. Basically, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, I personally think that True Detective is the first example of a show really, s- not suffering, but... It's hard to process week to week because you do want to do exactly what we're what Holly did and a lot of people are doing, which is go back and rewatch the episodes. But we're piecing it together yeah. because we don't have the rest of the show. I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you, Clark. There because here's my feeling about it. I like the idea. I mean, I can totally understand the whole. You know, we were talking about House mm-hmm. of Cards and and binge watching these episodes. What I like about True Detective is kind of what I liked about Twin Peaks when it was mm-hmm. airing. Um, I'm much older than you, so I remember watching it week to week, 
Um, and I was, you know, it was like we were trying to piece together who the killer was. Uh -huh. Much in the same way we're doing now. Right. Um, but uh, it's... And that's part of the experience It was part of the you? experience, yeah. That's it was part of it part for of the experience. You? It was like, okay. now I get to go back and now I have to... I have to be the detective. I have to figure out what what's connected and what's not connected and okay. who these people are to each other. Um, and it's frustrating, but it's also invigorating. In okay, way. cool. Well, that's good. I, I might be of a different, yeah, I, I feel, I feel like it's, it's challenging. That might just be your age difference. That's <laughs> so possible. I don't know. I don't or it's a type of viewer. It's it definitely a type of viewer. Definitely. I mean, it's definitely speaking to, because. Not that I don't a good, enjoy a good Well, and watch, that's but. the other thing too, is like, I kind of like the idea of the sixth sense, right? Where you, you go through it once, you had the wool pulled over your eyes completely, yeah. and then you go, holy shit, I gotta Whoa. go back and watch it again. Yeah. And and then once you go back, or The Prestige is yeah. a great example of yeah. that. You go back, you watch it again, and you go, oh my god, there Why were all that? these little clues. It was so and that's, obvious. that's such a sign of incredible writing, and I think that's what we're yes. seeing with True Detective. It sure, it definitely is. But, so, um, that goes back to the, the last night's reference of The Yellow King. Um, because to me, that's obviously the most obvious. Holly found a, an, a your example of the preacher preaching and being almost. You there know, are a lot more. Yeah, of them, and I I'm, bore you with all. Well, of no, them, but, but it's good. It's really good, and and they are there. They are subtly and not subtly. But last night's reference reminded me of one of the short stories in particular. Okay, and, um, can't wait to hear this. And it has a, you know, I wish I had the, I don't have the title of the short story in front of me. And it's not that I'm a knucklehead. It's a long, confusing <laughs> title, okay? Yeah. But um, it is a, it is the one that I've referenced before about the man who uh, tells us that he is, um, he had uh, participated in military service. He was thrown from his horse. He injured his head. Mm -hmm. And he was never quite right after that. Okay. Um, he also mentions that he had been institutionalized. Okay. Um, and he basically throughout the and he is your classic Edgar Allan Poe untrustworthy narrator Okay. So basically, you know when you're reading his words not to trust that you can't he's exactly. These are the these these are the talkings of a madman. Right. Um. And through that, it's similar to the yellow wallpaper. As you watch this lead character in Charlotte Perkins uh, Perkins Gilman, right? The, the yellow wallpaper is a great short know. story, but it's it. about a woman who descends into madness okay. because her. You know, yellow actually is a color that yes, has been tied it is. to. To madness for many for a long time and in many literary references. But. That's absolutely right. That's a great point, actually. Yeah. The yellow wallpaper is mm -hmm. another such story where so but basically the point I'm getting at is you know when you're reading this first short story in this anthology that you cannot trust the person who's telling the story. Now here's where I was reminded of this this story in particular, and it made me go okay, wait, am I supposed to not trust Cole? Am I supposed to think that he's lying to me the whole time? Because he's insane. Because he doesn't know. Well, you know, that's part of the thing, too. This episode, more than any other, up until this point, he's been so articulate. And and I've been buying everything he's... Not yeah. buying everything he's been saying, but, you know, he he's this really in, insanely intelligent yes. guy. And this one, he's starting to speak in Reggie Ledoux speak. And, and the whole time about, you know, the whole um, monologue about the, the time being a flat circle. That was, br oh, that blew my mind, blew by away. the way. Yeah. That was unbelievable. But the metaphor I of know. The, the circle and now it's, I was just like, Wow. It's getting to him. Though. I mean, that well, it's gotten to him. It's, you know what it's I mean? so br it's so smart though. It's yeah. so smart, and yet it's so crazy. Yeah. So here's the thing though. That clearly was the trigger. He says the yellow. The suspect says the yellow king, mm -hmm. and and Cole loses his mind and loses his girlfriend and, and disappears. And death before any of those repercussions happen with Cole directly. Death follows that suspect. Now that is the other part of the Yellow King. Oh, okay. When the Yellow King appears in these stories, in these short stories, to the literary reference, what happens is either the person who has encountered the Yellow King or the person who has read the Yellow King's text, Goes crazy. they go crazy and they often end up dead. So okay. when I saw having read, and I haven't read all four of the short stories that reference the I'm Yellow gonna read King. I'm going to them this week. They're, they're, by the way, guys, 
I will put up in our comments. I was gonna say that we a should link definitely post because it. these are public domain yeah. by now, so you can read them. And just so you guys know, if you're interested, the first four stories in the anthology titled "The Yellow King" are the ones that actually reference the King in Yellow, which is the play. The other, I think there are maybe eight others, seven, and eight I think others. Actually, Nick. Uh... The, the creator? Yeah, the, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce his last I name. I don't either. Um, Sorry, but, yeah, um, he's actually said the same thing. He said that it's not the entire... It's not. Well, yeah. I mean, and that's just the truth. Like, basically, um, just I can tell you right now, it's not even a matter of opinion. The Yellow King character, play, et cetera, et cetera, does not... It, the, the last eight short stories in the anthology are not horror short stories. I see. Okay. They're just... It's just all short stories in a in a collection. Gotcha. Um, but, so, we've got this... Um, so, here, here it is. Here's a perfect textbook example of insanity and death mm -hmm. following the yellow king. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and that's another thing, too, is I think that we didn't really delve too much into the, the suspect who died, but um, where that call came from, where... Exactly. Who made the call? What did they say? Mm -hmm. I, you know, to me, I think... Someone's pulling the strings. Yes, and here's what I think it is. I think it's a church. You think it's a church? I huh? think it's a church. So you're off the you're off the uh, Marty being the killer. Well, thing? Marty might be involved in the oh. church. I was, <laughs> I was like, she's finally given that up. I, I'm not. But, no. <laughs> I, I'm still not. I'm still not. I'm still not a hundred convinced. A hundred percent convinced. But I do think that the Yellow King is going to present himself as a minister, or a large figure. Yeah, I'm actually. I'm going to go along with that to a certain extent, too, because going back to seeing the third episode mm -hmm. again, there's some really suspicious activity just going on with that revival. I can't remember the name. I'm going to find the name of the the Friends of Christ revival. There are, there are people there who actually have said they've seen, like Bert was supposedly uh, one person who had supposedly seen the tall man. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all people that were connected with Dora Lang at some point, because Dora Lang was also, I mean, there's all... All these connections, we we haven't pieced together who this tall man is, but there's a church, definitely, obviously, a church connection. Yes, and I'd like to throw something out, else out there, too, and this may sound like a really weird left field reference, but, um, so, The Crucible, okay, mm -hmm. the, Arthur Miller's The Crucible, um, b basically, there, there are a lot of references to hallucinations and seeing things in The Crucible, and actually, historically, if you look back into that time period, these hallucinations were probably caused by these people accidentally eating a mushroom, or a root, or something like that, mm -hmm. that's creating these hallucinations, and they don't know why, okay? Well, they mentioned, didn't they mention there was LSD in the, I mean, I mean, there's LSD in the uh, in the lab where the shootout was. Right. There. Well, there we know there's drugs. That's there's okay. Drugs. So that's yeah. part of it. We know that there's drugs involved. But the reason I bring up the crucible is just this idea of people who don't know that they're under the influence of something. Right. Whether that's metaphorical, like religion. Like religion, or, or actually chemical. Exactly. Yeah. And I would not put it... And, I, I, and putting the two together, you've got a powerhouse. And that is exactly what I'm getting at. Yeah. There's a, the idea of drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. There's, there's something to that, mm -hmm. I think, in this instance specifically. And I think what we're going to see is the Yellow King reference as this, which it means historically of bringer of death or bringer of, you know, insanity and madness. I think we're going to see that manifest itself yeah. in perhaps some religious icono iconography, which we already saw in the pilot, yeah. right? We mm -hmm. know that these figures and these shapes are religious iconography. And yeah. we know that um, Dora was involved in the church. And we know that the man was around the church so I think right. that it's all going to come together under that to umbrella. sort of wrap things mm -hmm. up the final scene we see Cole in uh, in the building yep. with the with those 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 witch de what are they called devil oh, I think yeah something, something like, like that, that. Mm -hmm. and they're pretty fresh they're like green and covered in moss. not that I mean I'm sure they're using multiple materials to make these things but I'm just trying to figure out what I mean this is we're seeing we're seeing Cole sort of descend off into his his spiral. His, no pun intended. His spiral. <laughs> good one. Uh, very good. Um, but yeah, I, I it's this is the trajectory towards towards seeing Cole unravel a little mm -hmm. bit more. And I think we heard that in a lot of the things he was saying to the investigators, um, because he's actually starting to. It's like he's 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 
absorbing and almost believing his own shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> or the, or the, believing some of the... I, I think that remains to be seen. I think what we're what will be interesting as the next couple of episodes unfold is sort of seeing, are they trying to trick the audience and to or mislead the audience? You think that they're trying to mislead the audience to make them think it's cold? Possibly. I don't think so. I think we're too smart for that. I think we. I think we're definitely. I think most of us are too smart to think that Cole is. I, it's pretty obvious to me because the investigators clearly are not supposed to be proxies for us. We're not supposed. You know what I mean? I don't think that the investigators. At this point, I feel like the investigators. They've been trying to push it down Marty's throat that it's Cole. Now, obviously, they we know as an audience they think it's Cole. Mm -hmm. um, they planted some seeds that Cole is a little off his mm -hmm. nut, but. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that, at least, I, I can only speak for myself, I don't think that it's, um, that they're trying to lead us towards well, believing that it's cold. I, I, I think that maybe... It's the, a MacGuffin! Yes, Again, indeed. To bring back the word MacGuffin. I, I yeah. think that, I think that what they're getting at is not necessarily, I think that for most viewers, for most people, they could look at a character like Rust Cole and say, that person's insane. Mm -hmm. That person's crazy. That person is not normal. Well, look at him. He's making weird little dolls but with metal beer cans. Yeah, and... that's true. He he's. I'm wondering if he's trying to do something with that. By the way, if he's trying to actually create like a diorama or something to 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 show. It's possible. Or if he's just messing with. It's possible. It's all possible. But that's the thing, and this is why I kind of ha took issue with this idea of okay, our resolution for last night's episode was we think Cole is the suspect. I kind of thought no, because if you're watching. If you're watching the per performance of Matthew McConaughey in each episode, it is so authentic. Mm -hmm. It is so there is nothing behind. Do you get? And not that he's that he's vapid or vacant, but there he is so. He's he's. You mean he's, he's got the narrow? He's got the tunnel, vision. tunnel vision. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. When he is looking at he's this case, got a laser focus. You can almost yeah. see the the wheels turning. You yeah. can see that there is nothing. There is nothing else in this man's mind no, other than case, I have to figure, figure this, this out. out. Whereas when I watch Marty Hart look at the same things that Russ Cole is looking at, I see him kind of going, that's dumb, whatever. He's also said things very clearly. This is going long today, guys. I'm sorry. But um, uh, he said something in a few episodes past where he's like, there's a point where responsibility is, fu is futile, is mm -hmm. futility. He doesn't care. He's not invested in it. See, and I think that he's. I think that he's um, playing a game. Okay. Like I think he's being flippant on purpose. I think he's being like, oh, it's. it's we know so they're really good liars. So exactly. It's, it's I, I. And even if, even if Marty is not the person, you know, pulling the trigger, which you know, whatever you get the you get yeah. the metaphor. <laughs> even if he is not the one doing the deed, I do think that there is something to his consistent and constant brush off, of. He's too flip. Yes. He's too flip. I agree with you. I think he's too flip. I think there's, there's, he's definitely covering things up. Yeah. We don't know what it we is. We don't know what that is. Yeah, or what that is. He means. wants to get rid of those investigators, I feel like. Mm -hmm. He just sure. wants to, you know. So, um, yeah, I agree with you there. Yeah. There's one thing I want to say just about the show as a whole, mm -hmm. and maybe we can, we can wrap up on this note. Sure. But um, one of the things I love about the series is that it is an anthology series, and that as opposed to, and I was yes. thinking, I was talking about this with my boyfriend, and uh, we were talking about the fact that feature films can't do what a show like this can do. And Not anymore. Have, no, they can't. But the other thing is about it, that it's the fact that it's an anthology, and we only have eight, eight episodes to watch to see this entire arc begin, have the beginning, middle, and end, and come to full, full fruition, full completion, as opposed to any other series say Breaking Bad or you know any other series where it's open ended and right. and the creators of the show are like well do we get another season do we have another season to get they don't have that uh, it's a luxury I think in this mm -hmm. case that they have the opportunity to go nope we know where it's starting we know where it's ending and and everything in between and it's kind of not that it'll necessarily be wrapped up in, in a tight little bow for us but I, I enjoy knowing but that it's, it's going to be over. It's complete. It's a com it's a feeling of completion, and we're not even done yet. We only but, have three episodes left. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good thing. I think that that's a really um, important um, strength for this show, especially when you're dealing with crime, especially when you're dealing with detectives, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with the subgenre of, of drama. The idea that there is an end in sight. 
We are yeah. telling a compact and concise mm -hmm. story. This is the story that we want to tell you. It's eight out. It takes eight hours, and that's the end. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about the idea of, you know, um, you you tell a story. You used to be able to tell a story on film. Um, and not have to worry about franchise potential. Right. You know, if we had, think about if we had gotten The Godfather today, we would have gotten, like, Godfather Part 1 and Part 2 in 90 minutes. Yeah. And you go, no, I need time to tell this story. Yeah. And that's, I think, what we're getting is the appropriate it's amount of time. It's the beauty of television today. To it's tell the beauty a story. Of, yeah, it's the beauty of cable television. It's the beauty of, of, of narrative storytelling these days. And it's quality and not quantity. Yeah. That's the point. It doesn't matter if we got, you know, 12 episodes of True Detective or if we get 8 episodes of True Detective. If True Detective needs 8 episodes... Give it eight episodes. Mm -hmm. Why does it have to be twelve? Why does it have to be twenty two? Exactly. I think that it's a re it's a real sign of confidence that HBO is showing to the creators of the show and the people involved in the show. We're going to give you the means to tell your story the way you need to tell mm -hmm. it. Which is and we're, uh, yeah, and we have faith in everything you're doing. Right. And I think HBO is probably one of the only people, one of the only networks and I mean, Netflix and maybe AMC. Well, not even AMC. Yeah, because we know no AMC is notoriously cheap and won't give anybody any money. <sighs> That's true. Sorry, but yeah. it's true. Yeah. I mean, if you're not going to give, you know, Breaking Bad or The Walking Dead, or if Mad Men is still having to haggle for budget, then yeah, I don't know. Anyway, okay, that's our episode. <laughs> so this was kind of a series recap as well, which yeah. I think is really good because things are really starting to come, you know, to kind of cultivate and come together. So that's exactly. good. So thanks for sticking with us. Uh, we will be back next week as well. Um, and please be sure to follow us on the Twitters. On the Twitters. Um, I am at Clark Wolf. Clark I with the knee, Wolf with the knee. Sorry. I am I, I am at Holly K. Payne, P-A-Y-N-E. And you can follow uh, the Boys Club on Twitter as well. We are welcome to TBC. And uh, we have a Facebook page, mm -hmm. which you can like if you would like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and comment. Comment. We would love to hear your thank feedback. Thank you for your comments last week, pointing out the mistakes that we made. Exactly. And we will have that link to um, to the Yellow King. Yes. The King in Yellow. Um, so you the can LK. read that for yourselves. And, uh, yeah, and you can check out all this fun stuff, yeah. if you so choose. Um, I've written an article about it for Nerdist. io9 just wrote a big oh, article about great it. Great article. Yep. Highly recommend yep. reading they took, that. They took what I did, and they built on it so that... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. She started it. I did. I know. <laughs> Holly found it. I started it. We're all on the same team here. No, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, anyway, th thanks so much for watching, and uh, we will see you next week. See you next week.